just put a smile on that face. <laughs> no, but the Joker cannot win. Gotham needs its true hero. You either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. I can do those things because I'm not a hero. Not like Dent. I killed those people. That's what I can be. I'm whatever Gotham needs me to be. Call it in. You'll hunt me. You'll condemn me. Set the dogs on me. And welcome to Seismic Cinema. So from that poorly done Batman voice, you will know that it's uh, a quote from The Dark Knight. Okay, so I'm James, your host. I've probably written an essay on it. Paul's probably watched it in the wrong order. And I've probably not seen it. There we go. Um, so, again, thanks for listening, tuning in, watching things, guys. So, a bit of housekeeping before we get into it all. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Threads, TikTok, and Facebook. We've got a wee community page um, on Facebook. We've got quite a few followers on that. I dare say, um, search us on Facebook. You'll be able to get us on there. You can watch and listen to us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Audible, and Amazon Music. Seismic Cinema would like to thank the Fast Camels for our title and end credit track, Tales of the Expected. The Fast Camels are an explosive blend of 60s-influenced psychedelia, freak beat, and classic power pop. You can check them out on Spotify, YouTube, and on their website through bandcamp.com. Thanks, guys. Um, we bit before I go into... You know, plug in other shows and things like that. Just want to give a week and a update in the stats. So thanks again for you know subscribing and liking and sharing, guys. Much appreciated. But it's came to the attention that on YouTube in particular, that 83.6% of people view the content, but they do not subscribe. So all it is, guys, is a wee click of a button on YouTube to help just subscribe. We're sitting at 148 subscribers on YouTube. And we would just love to get to 150. That was the kind of milestone from before. We're too off it. We need your help. So um, if you could just like, tell people about them, about us rather, and hopefully, you know, word of mouth can can help us grow. Okay. So we are also part of the Podpack Collective. Um, as a bunch of like-minded indie podcasters who are trying to improve and make the indie podcast environment a better place to be in. So check them out, guys, um, on Twitter. And you can be able to get the, from the link, link tree on there. You'll be able to go in and um, see the different type of podcasts. So they're not all you know, necessarily film TV podcasts, a lot of variety of podcasts out there. Okay, and we shout out to our friends at Wet's Script. Um, thanks for your support, folks, and thanks for listening. Um, we did, I listened to their review on Armageddon um, with the Wreckfast crew. I think that's their name. I probably butchered their name right enough, but um, Wreckfast Club, obviously. From the oh, yeah, I was going to say it was club. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course it is. It came to me there as a as I said it wrongly. So I had a great episode and I listened to the Rocky Four um, just yesterday. Quality, absolute quality, guys. So keep it up. Thanks very much again. And for... I, I listened to their, it's an old one, but I listened to their uh, review of The Hangover. Um, 
a couple of days ago, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, for their recent Titanic episode. Aye, just keep them coming, guys. It's uh, funny and informative. Um, it's brilliant. So. And we're, pri- we're privileged to share a WhatsApp group with you. <laughs> we are indeed, even though I'm on quite a lot on it, but that's by the by. Anyway, so moving on. So, Colin, before we go into the actual Dark Knight review, um, we can a segment. Have you been watching anything differently from the last time I seen you? Um, to be honest, I've been absolutely knackered most of the week. So, the second episode of uh, Only Murders in the Building on Disney Plus. It's uh, quite a quirky wee show. You said you've watched the first. A season yourself a uh, so enjoying that a um, friday night i watched batman begins because i felt to do this review justice i should probably refresh my memory on batman begins and then last night and a wee bit this morning if i'm totally honest um due to tiredness factors i watched a the dark night for this review and then i'm hoping to Probably watch The Dark Knight Rises next weekend just to complete the trilogy. Uh huh. Good stuff. I guess yeah. Uh, for me, uh, um, I've got watched the latest episode on Expedition Bigfoot. Um, you'll be, you'll be. They, ca- they caught him yet? They've not caught him yet. No, but listen. <laughs> it's, it's... <laughs> but it's about the journey, not the destination. It's all about the journey, man. Yeah. So it will be. It's the. It will be. We'll get him. We'll get you know it's you know it's not just a a, a male bigfoot is out there by the way just let you know that as well there's there's it is female bigfoots but we'll get them we will and I feel I'm part of the journey with them now so um so I'm watching I watched the latest episode on that hopefully I'll resume Dexter season eight um I'm still one on episode one now so hopefully I could try and resume that later on maybe tonight or maybe start next week or something like that. Um, just as you mentioned Batman Begins, when you told me that you were doing both Batman Begins and Batman The Dark Knight, I was like, oof, that's a lot of screen time, because they're pretty long films. Well, I watched I'm the first, I watched like the first hour and a half of Batman Begins on Friday night, and then I watched the last hour last night, and then I watched like the first hour and a half of Dark Knight last night, and I had to watch the rest this morning, because I was knackered. Well, I said to you before, I could play a part in this film, so I've seen it that many times. Um, however, you know, as a dedication to the podcast, I did watch it again last night, but I fell asleep. Um, and I woke up on my couch at half one in the morning, you know, in darkness. Been like, there. Where am I? You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I had my, my notes in my laptop beside me, taking, you know, taking some notes and things, and it was lying on the floor. I got woken up, actually, with a laptop hitting the flare. So, um, it was a rude awakening, <laughs> but I watched the rest of Smallin, um, so just to catch myself up, okay. So, on to the Dark Knight, then, mate. 2008 it was released. Um, I want to give a quick synopsis, um, of the film. So, with the help of allies Jim Gordon and Dent, Harvey Dent, Batman has been able to keep a tight lid on the time in Gotham City. But when a vile young criminal calling himself the Joker suddenly throws it, sorry, throws the town into chaos, the crepe Casada begins to tread a fine line between heroism and vigil- vigilantism. Easy for me to say. It was written and directed by Christopher Nolan. Uh, Jonathan Nolan did help him write um, the screenplay. The cast, a phenomenal cast, uh, well, of course, following on from the, the first film, All Bar One. Christian Bale, Heath Ledger, Aaron Eckhart, Michael Caine, Morgan Freeman, Gary Oldman, and Maggie Gyllenhaal, who of course wasn't in the original Batman Begins. The score was by Hans Zimmer. The runtime for the film was two hours and 32 minutes, so it was quite a, a lengthy film. The budget was $185 million, and it took over just over $1 billion. So it was uh, very, very successful. It won two Academy Awards, one for Heath Ledger, um, a posthumous um, Best Supporting Actor, and it got the Oscar for Best Sound Editing. 
the rating on IMDb was 9 out of 10. That's pretty spectacular. Have I missed anything there, Colin, do you think? No. I see you're the, I see you're the Batman expert of the two of us. Ah, well, um, I'll give my, my, my uh, excitement. I'll make sure I do have that throughout the board and enthusiasm and stuff like that. Right, before I go into um, the actual, before we go into Twitter comments and whatever have you, um, and the Meet the Bones of the film, what is your history of the film? And I don't mean like the Dark Knight in particular, because, you know, I think it's maybe important to, have you read any of the comics from before? Have you uh, watched any of the previous films from before? What is your kind of overall views on Batman and the films? So I was never really a, a Batman fan fan as a child i was always a bit more spider-man and x-men they were like kind of my main two and then in kind of last five years or so i got really into the kind of mcu and that kind of thing in terms of superhero films but it was probably this trilogy the nolan trilogy that kind of piqued my interest in the the world of gotham but also the the character of batman as well and i would say since i watched this trilogy back in the kind of late 2000s and um, i've became much more of a fan i would say uh, i've seen a uh, joker in the cinema i saw the batman in recent years i've watched like batman 89 which we did a review of actually back in the day mm-hmm. um i remember watching like Batman and Robin and things like that as a kid, like some of the kind of 90s Batman films, which is obviously a bit of a different vibe. So I'd say my my interest has kind of increased over the last few years. My stepson, Jordan, is a Batman fanatic. So um, that's kind of rubbed off on me a wee bit. And he kind of like, like watching the films together and things like that. And I'm quite looking forward to the the Penguin show that's coming out this year, I think. Aye. Because um, I remember being absolutely terrified of uh, Danny DeVito's Penguin in the 90s. That's a, a kind of vivid memory. That's probably my most vivid memory of Batman from like childhood was being terrified of the Penguin. Um, and probably that's about and I've never really played any of the the games, and I've I've never been a big comic book guy. Uh, the odd one, in kind of recent years, but uh, I would definitely say I'm a lot more invested in the world now, probably because of this this trilogy. So, so uh, that. no, no, I think this film plays a big part on you know the um, the culture surrounding kind of superhero films and I'll touch on that later on in the podcast. Um for me, like I've for what, as long as I can remember, do you know what I mean? It is Batman. It was a car love the cartoons. Um remember watching the films, um you know, the Michael Keaton films, Batman and Batman Returns. Um much so much so that I love the cartoon that much that you know I've said before in a previous pod that um my mum and dad got me a, a, a Batmobile kind of toy with the, the kind of shot out the yellow kind of missiles and things like that. So, yeah. uh, and then the, the kind of figures and whatever. So, like, totally obsessed with Batman. Um, obviously, as I got older, I kind of got into the Joel Schumacher ones, which is the one you were talking about, Batman and Robin, Batman Forever and things, mm. um, which basically you enough know, killed the, the Batman. Um, franchise because they were all truly awful films um batman forever not as much as batman and robin but it's still you know it's still with we're poor i think i maybe mixed up my titles which you're frozen now i'm back you're back yeah you know you said you mixed up your titles what do you mean yeah which which is the one i'm thinking of with the was Danny DeVito's Penguin in a few different films in the nineties? No, Batman. He Danny DeVito's Penguin was in Batman Returns. We yeah, that's Keaton. that's that's probably what I'm thinking of from childhood. Then, All right, Michael Keaton and um, 
Michelle Pfeiffer were in that um, Batman Returns, which is a Christmas film, really, as well. <laughs> yeah, I've, anyway. heard, <laughs> I've, heard that, I've heard that one. <laughs> um, Batman Forever was, was the one with Jim Carrey and what's his name? Tom Lee Jones is Harvey Dent. Yeah, doing my Thurman. And, no, no, sorry, my Thurman was in the last the Batman and Robin one. Um, so, I, so Batman and Robin had Alice Schwarzenegger, Uma Thurman, um, and a few others. I can't remember now. It was that bad, though. Hmm. But obviously, watching the, you know, I've watched the animated series as well, do you know what I mean? And all different things like that. So, listen, it's just phenomenal. Um, I, I, can, I play the computer games as well. So, I have, uh, I've got a, a good history with the films. Had you seen the the Netflix show? I don't think it was actually Netflix. If you just it was on Netflix anyway. Gotham. Last year oh, I actually watched. I watched some of it. Like I started watching it and kind of fell out of it. But watching these films again is actually. I'm not saying I will at the moment, but I think it's probably when I'll go back to it at some point. Aye. Uh, the good thing about Gotham is, as well, that it focuses on Jim Gordon's kind of progression through the police, Gotham PD, but also it has Bruce Wayne in it, obviously, because that's how it all starts, but not really focusing him too much. It's more kind of on the antagonists. So you see like the evolution of Harvey Dent, for example. You see um, Victor Freeze as Mr. Freeze and... Obviously, Catwoman as well, uh, Selena Kyle. So, there's loads of you know characters you might not necessarily see in the films, but are mm-hmm. quite prominent in the actual comics and stuff. I've read the comics. Do you know what I mean I, I can count in one hand how many comics I've read in my entire life? But it's good that they're going to, like shows that you know Gotham and films coming out nowadays are kind of aiming towards kind of you know like. Like about term geeks, do you know what I mean? So it's that's good in that way. No, it's one I might go back to at some point. Who is it that plays the who is it that plays the penguin in Gotham? It's quite a well known actor, is it not? I uh, is it not the boy it's in see you seen what's that film called? Wedding Crashers. I have seen it, but I can't see, remember who, who it is the, referring the, to. The weird son. I think it's him. I can't remember who it is, but he's good in it. He's really good in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nah, well, I will. I may go back to it at some point. I'm right. Aye, you should, sure, mate. It's, it's, it's good. I watched, I don't know if I watched like the full first season, but I watched a fair few episodes of it and I quite enjoyed it. Just, you know, sometimes you just fall away from shows. Oh, aye. I've been there a few times. Right, okay, moving on then. So we did reach out to um, our Twitter fans fans, is that what I like to call them? Followers and Facebook followers about Se- the seismic supporters. Seismic supporters, there we go. I like it, man. I like it. So we reached out to the seismic supporters and you know we're doing this this week, this film this week, and we got quite a few comments on it, Colin. Do you have that in hand? We can give them a wee shout out. Yeah, I'll start with our uh, Facebook group. Paul Parks. Is that something you know? No. No. Um, oh well, hi Paul Parks. Um, he said it absolutely is, which was something in reference to your post. Um, was that was that was that a ten out of ten? I don't, I don't think I gave him a ten out of ten. No, I just I think you maybe asked if it was a ten out of ten. But oh well. uh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. We did an episode on it, so Paul Parks is a podcaster. So yeah, go check out their podcast as well. Um, they did an episode on it not too long ago, and Sophie really enjoyed it for Heath Ledger's portrayal of the Joker. And then James, yourself, replied, um, Heath played an absolute blinder and was the main attraction of the film, very similar to the original Batman in 1989. Nicholson stole the show with that performance and left Keaton in his dust. And then Emma Stewart said it's one of her favourite films. And then quoted, I'm going to make this pencil pencil disappear. Ta-da. I'm not going to do the Joker voice. Uh, Heath Ledger was just incredible. The improv for the hospital explosion. And then the kind of chef's kiss kind of emojis. 
and then James agreed and felt that the Joker is pretty much made the film memorable. Walking into Moroni's place and performing his magic was brilliant. And then on Twitter, dissect that film said their favorite scene is any scene with the Joker in it. Heath Ledger was an unstoppable force in this movie. The Dark Knight is on my top three all-time favorite list. And uh, and we also had another comment from Craig from What's the Script said, definitely the best of the three and in the top two for the best overall with Batman 89. What can you say that hasn't been said before? Well, I suppose we better just stop the podcast now. <laughs> we we reviewed it, as you know, so check out their review. And from the bank heist to Harvey's demise, it's a 10 out of 10, in my opinion, and then a bat emoji. So please make sure you check out um dissect that film what's the script and paul park's podcast which i've got a funny feeling might be sp film reviewers but i could be wrong i think it is actually i think you've uh, mentioned sophie didn't yeah, you so yeah. uh, so, uh, so is it, who's the other emma was it so thanks for the comment yeah. folks much appreciated um right thanks colin for that mate all right, I'll do your job for you. <laughs> Unless you just want me to talk through the full thing, mate. Do you know what I mean? You can just put your feet up. <laughs> well, I need, I need to, you know, delegate my tasks some way. You know what I mean? So I'm with, I'm with you up. Ah, you better be. Anyway, so let's get into it then. Let's get into the, the the review of the Dark Knight 2008. So, as aforementioned, it was released in 2008. It was dated by Christopher Nolan, and it's the second in the Nolan trilogy. And in my opinion, it redefines superhero films. People might not necessarily agree with that, but I think this is better than any MCU film ever made. So come at me, people. Come at me. But it's my opinion. Right, so the, the opening scene of this film, it was the, the bank robbery, the bank heist. And... All we see is a, you know a bunch of people wearing kind of um, masks, you know, kind of like clown masks. Um, and they all had different roles to play within that bank heist. Um, it was very orchestrated. Don't know, kind of know what's going to happen. Quite unpredictable what happens. How did you feel for that scene? Do you think it was a perfect setup for the film? Do you think you got introduced to the Joker at that point in time, or was that later on in the film you got properly introduced to him? How do you feel that the, that is a scene on its own set up for the rest of the film? I think it's ter- certainly a way to start with a bang. Like There's no kind of preamble, no messing about. You're just right into it. Um, and you've got all these different characters. And If you didn't know anything about Batman, if you didn't know who the Joker was going into this, then you're a bit kind of curious about who all these people dressed up are. Um, and you've obviously got the the bits where they keep kind of like taking each other out when their backs are turned. Um, and it's funny because I haven't actually watched this film in quite a few years, actually. So I actually forgot that the Joker was part of the, the group. I actually had it in my head that we met him later on. Aye. So it was a nice kind of reveal for me, I suppose, when uh, he he turns out to be the last guy because he's saying the guy's like, "What are you talking about a bus?" And then the bus comes crashing into the bank, a bit like the the car into Tesco in Greenock uh, this week. <laughs> I heard about that. <laughs> um. <laughs> um, so yeah, I kind of forgot that he was in that scene, but so it was a nice surprise. Um, but obviously, if you kind of looked back at it, you would recognise his hair behind the mask uh, as they're going along but it's also quite interesting what they're doing because they're like they are the joker is the the big bad of the film but they're essentially stealing like money away from the mob so they're like kind of against the other villains as well Aye. so uh, also the guy and um, the actor that plays the the bank manager is also i recognize him and i actually had it in my head that he was from lost like another character was but i looked it up just before we came on but he's the 
the guy from Prison Break. Yep. Kellerman, I think you name No, no, Kellerman. William, William Fit- Fitchner. Aye. Uh, but I recognised him right away when uh, when he came onto the scene. And obviously he starts shooting, which is at them, which is a bit weird for the bank manager. But then it's <laughs> quickly it's quickly revealed that the the mob essentially controls the bank, and that's why he's armed and ready to yeah. to fight. You know, so I think it's a good entrance. It's a great reveal for the the Joker, and it's, it's yeah, it's a good, a really good setup for the film. Aye. Um, I couldn't remember his name. He wasn't part of obviously my, the cast that I listened to at the start, but he's in Prison Break. He's also in Armageddon. He's also in The Longest Yard as well. The remake of The Longest Yard um, with Adam Sandler, I think it is. Um, aye. So, uh, really good. I really enjoyed it. I didn't. I think if you've seen, like, obviously, the, the pictures of the Joker and all that beforehand, you'd be able to see that, you know, the way he was dressed and his hair behind the mask, hmm. that it was the Joker. Um, but if you hadn't, then you've seen the Joker at that point, at the start. You know, what, what he believes in, you know, whatever doesn't kill you, it only makes him stranger. So <laughs> that, that was a good bit. Um, but you said, like, you rewatched this even though, you know, inside and out, but... There is always something that you'll catch that maybe you forgot about, and the, the kind of since you last watched it. Well, saying that, listen, there's a scene uh, that I like, you know, obviously from before I've said before, you know, I watch kind of things on Bigfoot and all that sort of thing. But it's actually a, um, a picture of Bigfoot on the actual bulletin board um, in Gotham PD, which I've never noticed before. It's brought to my attention. So there yeah, you go. Put, I think they put that in just for you. Well, it's, it's taken me long enough to bloody find it. Or, <laughs> um, so, I uh, so, so it'd be brought, brought to my attention that was. So, um, there you go. The finally seen it after the 3,000th watch or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> so, that's obviously an important scene, the bank scene, the bank case rather. And it's, I'm going to come back to this, but it's, it was the first film, The Dark Knight, to actually use IMAX cinematography. Which the number of it's the number of frames they have, mm-hmm. which they used it in this scene, and they used it when they went to Hong Kong to to um, extradite Lao. But we'll come on to that when I come to the cinematography section. Um, like I say, I'm not going to go through it scene by scene, but I think I've got a list of scenes here I thought were significant. So Harvey Dent, we are into just as. His character, played by Aaron Eckhart, is the Gotham's White Knight, as opposed to Batman being the Dark Knight. He is the symbol of hope. Um, and we are first into just to him, um, really, in the the restaurant. When you know he's obviously um, he's with Rachel. That's his his girlfriend, I suppose. Um, his squeeze. A squeeze. I knew I was going to say squeeze, cause it's going to... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I left that one out. So I was going to say squeeze, but um, so that's his girlfriend. Um, what were you see? What did you think of the introduction of Harvey Dent? I suppose, as well as how did you feel that they are so Bruce, um, Bruce Willis, Bruce Wayne, and Harvey Dent? What would you think their kind of dynamic was at that point when he was first introduced? Because obviously, Bruce Wayne has got a lot of um, feelings towards Rachel, mm-hmm. but he's also understanding what Harvey can do for the actual city of Gotham. Yeah, um, it's not just like a, a kind of cold intro for Harvey, though, because he is actually referenced in a couple of scenes beforehand when they talk about the new DA and how he's someone you probably want to get on board with. Um, I'm going to just put it out there. I, I think, well, there's obviously the Joker, but for me personally, I thought Harvey Dent was the most interesting character in the whole film. Um, so I think he's obviously, it's quite a, a tragic fall for him towards the end, but obviously you understand you could probably understand why based on what happens to him, but I think he does start out as someone who's really got a lot of integrity and kind of knows what they're doing. He's, he's pretty switched on in terms of capturing criminals. And I think 
Bruce Wayne recognizes that and he, he basically wants to work with him. Although he does make a wee joke where he's like, he doesn't know where Wayne Manor is, and he's like, <laughs> you should probably, you should probably know like what's in your jurisdiction. Um, I, I found that a wee bit jarring with the the Rachel stuff because I did I did remember that she was recast because obviously I watched by um, Batman Begins the night before, but I don't know about you. I I didn't quite take to this. I, I don't know. It was quite a jarring change. I, I don't think there's a particularly strong resemblance. So it kind of took me out a wee bit. It's like, who is this? Who is this person? What did you think of the recasting? Uh, I didn't like it at all. I just thought Maggie Gyllenhaal wasn't the right person for the role. Um, That's Jake, Jake's sister, isn't it? Aye. I just don't think she was the right person for the role, but who, who am I to say? Do you know what I mean? But I, there's nothing wrong with... Um, I forgot her name, Katie Holmes. Why? Why did she not come back? Do you know? I don't know. I don't know. But she was. I thought she was really, really good in the Batman Begins. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just don't know. I found her act, acting to be quite wooden. Actually, mm-hmm. it was. I don't know. People. I mean, people might disagree with me here and say mm-hmm. that you know that they preferred her over Katie Holmes, but. Well, for, not for me, obviously not for yourself. I just didn't like it. I'm going to be honest. This is probably one of the weaker aspects of the first two films. I'm not. I'm not a big fan of her character. If I'm being completely honest, she's. She kind of feels like she wants to have her her cake and eat it too. Like she leaves. She always kind of leaves a slight uh, door open for Bruce, and isn't fully committing while um, Harvey's alive. It feels like she's she's kind of just wanting the attention of both of them, and she's she's never. Obviously, she sends the the letter at the end, but which Bruce doesn't ultimately get to read. But I don't know what did what did you make of her character? I, I thought I found her quite a bit entitled and a bit just wanted everything. Um, I don't know. Like, I think she at the same time. No, I think she val- valued. Um, Bruce's friendship more than anything. I think deep down she knew that um, Bruce Wayne's destiny, I want to call it that, was to be Batman. He was, you know, it's all about justice and, you know, making sure that Gotham is, is, the, is the city that he, that he led to believe and the city that that he's, you know, Thomas and Martha Wayne would, would would love him to be in and keep safe. I think he, that was always his destiny. And I think for Rachel, Rachel, for Rachel, it would be like she always knew that would be. So I think she did follow your friend as kind of friendship more. And she did lead him on though. Like she she always oh, left yeah. a wee, she always left a wee bit of a door open. It's like if X happens, then we can be together. You know. Aye, well, that scene out in the when he came back and Batman's gonna, you know, Harvey said Batman's gonna give up his identity, and that's when Bruce says to her, you know, it's all it's over now. He's gonna get the consequences of being Batman. He's got to face some repercussions of it. Um, but now that's it's like a a weight off his shoulder type of thing. Um, but really deep down, he didn't want it to happen. Do you know what I mean? He didn't want it to happen. So I, I agree with you. I do agree with you, mate. Um, for Rachel as a character, and I've well went into the character section yet, and I suppose we, we won't have to discuss her anymore, but I I didn't particularly like her character through the film. And she said her purpose, obviously, because it was the... Obviously, they're kind of love rivals, um, as well as being the the dark and white knight of Gotham. Because she had her, she had her connections to other characters as well. Because um, Alfred's known her since she was a wee girl, and a Sirius Black, Gary Oldman. Aye, he's also he's also quite fond of her as well. Aye, it's um, the bit when Alfred goes, "Oh, you've known." Um, well, he goes to Alfred and says. You've known Rachel all life, and he goes, "Not yet, sir." 
Not yet, sir. <laughs> she's, uh, but basically, he has because she she obviously doesn't survive this one. Well, that's the foreshadowing part that I was going yeah. to point as well. So yeah, he does. I mean, it's, yeah. um, aye. That's, so, that was another bit. I remembered like bits of this film. Maybe not everything. But I couldn't actually remember whether Rachel lived or died. So again, that was another another bit. Aye. To to, to see. Okay. Um, another scene. So the jo- we've got the Batman must reveal himself. So the Batman, not the Batman, the Joker. Obviously, he's um, he's a, he's chaotic. He's creating chaos around Gotham. He's killing folk left, right, and centre. Um, and he's going, he's going to do more killing um, unless Batman reveals himself. Now, do you think the Joker really wanted to know who Batman was, or do you think you know he would, because he lived such a chaotic life that it would have mattered if he came as Bruce Wayne or Harvey Dent, whatever it is? He he didn't really care. So, only go man. Sorry, I'm going to follow up I for think- a second. He didn't. I don't think he really showed that much curiosity about who he who he actually was, um, and he wouldn't really. He would also have heard of Bruce Wayne, but he didn't really have any real interactions with him on, on the screen, at least. No. So I don't think he'd have been been overly fussed because towards the end, he basically says he doesn't want to kill him because he's. Because he's too much fun, so he obviously goes from wanting him dead to not wanting him dead. But on the topic of that, um, that jump scare got me. By the way, with a the, when the, the, window. the the fake Batman drops down uh, in the window, yeah. I know. Was it, it says it start again? I can't remember this, but it's obviously with the scarecrow. It, it start yeah, it's the first film, and all the fake Batmans are in, and then. He goes, what's the, what did he say? He goes, what's the difference between me and you? And he goes, oh, um, I'm in hockey pants. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember that line. Um, uh, actually, on the topic of the Scarecrow, I don't see the what the purpose of having him in that one scene was. I feel like the caliber of actor and character, he's either in it or he's not in it. I think he's I think he's too big for a cameo. I know. I, did, I know I didn't. When he, was in, when he was in it at the start, again, because I hadn't seen it in a while, I was like, oh, is he going to factor into this? Because I thought he was a really strong part of the first film. I know, but he's kind of, Batman kind of basically ties them all up, doesn't he? At the, at the end I know, but he just leaves them with the fake Batman and other wannabes, and it's like, to me, like, why'd you, why'd you cast him just for one scene? Do you know what I mean? But I, mean, I don't know. I don't know, because he's in the Dark Knight Rises as well, do you know what I mean? Like, he's the... He's the judge in Dark Knight Rises, but I don't know. Maybe it's in his contract. He's going to be in all three films. I don't know. But for being such a prominent character in the first I film... Just, I just felt like... However, this film, like most Batman films, there's a lot of moving parts. So to try and fit another character into quite an already busy plot would have been quite challenging because you yeah. don't want a spider-man 3 situation where you've got like three three big villains in one film i know that's true um oh they got the 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 police being kind of villains as well because they have they're on the payroll do you know what i mean and who's taking who and uh, i know you've got maroni and uh the mob boss can i just touch on maroni while we're at him i right, sure do you know who the actor is? I recognise them, but I can't. No, right, so I've got some fun, three fun facts on him. Right. Uh, his name's Eric Roberts. Right. He's Julia Roberts' brother. Right. He's Emma. Do you know Emma Roberts? No. She's in quite a few like kind of like comedy movies. Um, that's that's uh, her dad, but he's also um quite a big character in Suits. All right. He he plays a guy called Charles Forsman, who's a kind of crook and quite a big antagonist in the show. So I was quite um, excited to see him as well. Oh, good. There's just such reference as well in there. Yeah. Yeah, Julia, Robert, Julia Roberts' brother. Oh, 
So you've had a Suits reference so far. You've had a Lost reference so far. Harry Bill, Potter. Your screen Harry Potter. Harry Potter, Harry Potter yeah. Um, fun fact, Julia Roberts visited the room once. She was seen she? on the high street. Yeah. Right, okay. Do you have a picture with her? No. 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 Oh. I got one with Emma Thompson, though. Oh, you told that before. All right. <laughs> you got one with um, Neil Warnock? No, I was too scared. I have a picture of him signed from years ago, but I was too scared to get a picture with him. Anyway, we digress. Um, aye, so I, what I was just going to get into, I don't think, obviously the Batman must reveal himself. It's just an excuse to create panic in, in Gotham. Joker, for me, didn't really care who he was. He didn't want to give himself up either, do you know what I mean? It was just an excuse for to create panic in, in Gotham for everybody to go against Batman. And then he, he kind of you can see him going through that dilemma, do you know what I mean? Of like, he's so far there's been three people killed, five people killed, and then eventually he goes, I'm going to try and give myself up here before Harvey Dent beats him to it. So you can see the actual tunnel while going, going through him because he, he gets rid of a lot of the evidence, doesn't he? Because he doesn't want anything to come back to Rachel or Lucius. And then there's that moment where he, he says to, to Michael Kane and Alfred, he goes, I'm going to just say that you got the whole idea. It, it was quite funny. Michael Caine is the, he has this, I suppose, the comic relief in this film, isn't he? <laughs> yes, he is good. Right, so um, next scene I want to talk about is the, the fundraiser. The fundraiser that Bruce Wayne um, hosts for Harvey Dent. Because obviously after the scene in the restaurant between Rachel then in Bruce Wayne, Bruce Wayne's soul, no what he's saying, he's like, you know, I'm going to raise your fund, a fundraiser, you know, one night with my pals, you'll, you'll be set for life type thing, you don't need to do anything else. Which is ironic because they're not actually his pals because in Batman Begins, he's he's not interested in the social scene at all and just no. wants nothing to do with it. Exactly. And it's that, it's, you ever um, read The Great Gatsby? Read it? Aye. Uh, no. Have you seen it? It's on my list. I've not seen the film, mate, but I've read the book. DiCaprio, isn't it? Ah, uh, he's in the film, man. That could be a future one, James. Possibly. I've read the, the book um, in school, right? But the great guy is like, um, like he's this guy he creates, like he's like the the Bruce Wayne of uh, West Egg, I think it is, is the, the name of it. Anyway, he has these parties and whatever have you, and it's quite kind of it seems quite similar to this type thing. You know, didn't really care. I just kind of went to those parties because he's a bootlegger and all that sort of thing. But um, anyway, that's another a, a different kind of thing. But it kind of reminded me of that a wee bit when I, when I was watching the film. It's kind of the fanciness at all, and um, it's the who's who of people being there. So, so you're talking about the the social scene. See the scene where Bruce takes away the whole like Russian like dancers on the boat. <laughs> and, it, and then I think that'd be a great like, um, like scene to see the outtakes, like just uh, Alfred just chilling on this uh, boat with all these young women. <laughs> and he's like, as long as you can tell me what's Russian for, apply your own sun cream or something like that. Apply your own. I can't do the voice, man. It's got King's voice, but that's <laughs> funny. Um, that's good that bit so I so what was I saying the fundraiser so you get the fundraiser for him and then that's when the Joker um, kind of gate crashes it Bruce Wayne kind of you know gets wind of him the Joker being coming after Dent because obviously it was happened before with the judge and, and the commissioner um, and the scene kind of is where he kind of the Joker's quite menacing in this one because See when he comes out the lift, you can see like this was kind of um, nobody knew. Michael Caine didn't know that he was coming out the lift at this point. If you watch it back, Michael Caine's face when he sees the Joker, it's like he's totally um, taken aback by him. And the, the way he goes in, you know, he takes the champagne off of um, people, and he basically takes the champagne off of the, the champagne is obviously spills over the floor, uh-huh. and then he goes to drink it, and it's no there. It's kind of to me, it reminded me of scenes of the Joker from '89 when he, you know, the flamboyant say entry of the party. Mm. Um, so we can basinger at that point, but people were scared. 
you know what I mean? And then the whole kind of grab his Rachel and he's asking them again, like, no, did I tell you about these scars? Which is a different story to the story he gave the the mob at the time. I wonder what the true story is. Well, aye, exactly. Because mm-hmm. that's like, he, he just makes it up as he goes along. That's again proves the chaotic nature of him. But what, what, what do you, what did you think of that scene? Um, obviously, when Batman comes in and then he, he fights the Joker and his cronies, then then you know goes after Rachel. Did you think that was a good scene? Kind of have you no know, the the Joker gate crashing the, and then obviously Bruce Wayne hiding because they all thought he was hiding in the panic room, which kind of makes him like a coward, but he wasn't really. Yeah, I think it's I think it's one of the the many ten scenes. I think it kind of those kind of scenes ramp up as the as the film goes on, but it's not just a it's there's three people who are targeted. There's the is it the police commissioner who ends up, up. Aye. who ends up kind of getting like poisoned off these his uh, bottle. And then there's the is, is the mayor part of that bit, or is it someone else? There's, there's no, it was a judge. Ah, uh, the judge who gets taken away in the car, and then the car gets blown up. Yep. And then there's Harvey as well. So that's obviously why the Joker went to the function to get Harvey Dent. Aye. And yeah, what I was going to say to you is like, if you've looked at a lot of the background on this. Was Heath Ledger quite a method actor? Like, see, when he was filming that scene, would he would he have just been like totally in character the whole time? And is that why people were quite f- spooked by it? Yeah, he was a total method actor. I would like I've watched, I've watched a few and interview, interviews before by people, even Chris Green Bale and Michael Caine, and they just said that this guy was unbelievable. Like, he was he just took his role, and you know it was his life, and. And it's sad we lost him. Do you know what I mean? And he's been on other films before, and um, but this will be the, the the most the film that people remember him most by because he's this his character and this the way he portrayed the Joker is for me the best hands down the best Joker, even better than Jack Nicholson. What you know what, um, what kind of age was he? Was he quite young? I think he was twenty four or something. Twenty five. I could be wrong yeah. there, but I think he was quite young. It's, it's the sad irony of how. Like he obviously had his own demons, but the character he was portraying had many demons, and you do wonder how kind of deep he got into that kind of mindset for that film, you know? Because it was it was the same. He died the same year it came out, didn't he? Aye. Yeah. Anyway, back to the the scene. Um, because at first you think because um, Harvey's kind of make like kind of been a bit. Like disrespectful towards Bruce to Rachel because uh, Bruce was talking to her on the the balcony and he calls her back in, but then he kind of turns up and like does he put him like a kind of sleeper hold, does it? And then he takes him off to to basically hide him from the Joker. Aye, that's right. So although he's his kind of love rival and. Harvey wasn't being particularly nice about Bruce at that point. Bruce obviously respects him enough and believes him in enough that he thinks he's someone he's got to get to safety. Uh, but then Bruce also kind of gives away his maybe parts of his identity and also his feelings for Rachel when he jumps off the building because the Joker references that later when he's like, oh, does Harvey know that, like... You, you, know, you, you little bunny. I say bunny, didn't uh, he? On screen, uh, um, so yeah, I think it's a really strong scene. There's the quite a humorous bit where there's like a one of the must be one of the Wayne Enterprise executives is essentially having an, a, an affair, <clears throat> and then Bruce opens up the the, the panic room and she's like, oh great a panic room and then the door just shuts and she's just like oh oh no. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's what like I like. Uh, it's quite- He's a kind of coward type thing because he's in a yeah. room. Nobody, but, you know. But um, actually, actual fact, he goes back and he saves saves everybody. Um, and that scene was quite good because, you know, he goes a little fight on you, and he goes, "Oh, you're gonna love me," type thing. The battle. Uh-huh. The Joker's got Rachel, you know, at the window, and he goes, "Let her go," and goes, "Pure <laughs> choice of words." Yeah. <laughs> and then 
the, the sorry the build up to this scene was because they found it was like a card from the Joker. It was like the real Batman stand up, and they they found like three lots of um, kind of DNA on it, wasn't it? And that's how they knew who, who he was targeting. Aye, they found the DNA for the commissioner, the judge, mm-hmm. and Harvey Dent. Because she gets the bit of, the judge gets the bit of paper, and it just says up. So it's like. I'm assuming it was blown up. That was the that was the point. Aye. Um, also, I make reference. See when when Rachel and Bruce Wayne were kind of standing outside in the balcony talking. Um, Rachel kind of says to him, I, "He doesn't know you well enough to know you're making fun of him." But he wasn't he making fun of him. He was like mm-hmm. genuinely being serious. Like he is the kind of savior at all and. Um, and I think that's kind of reflective of where Rachel thinks, because Rachel still thinks that he would never let go of this persona of Batman. Do you know what I mean? It's, yeah. So you know, that's why he held this in the first place. He was sold by him. He, he knows he can make a difference. And he was being true to his word. You know, he, he wasn't being you know, sarcastic or anything like that. But she yeah. thinks he was. She maybe just thought that because she's quite self centered and she thought. That he maybe wanted to like humiliate her boyfriend because he wanted to be with her. Maybe she thought he was kind of doing it to to get with her, sort of thing. Um, I really hope we are going to do a, a deep dive into Harvey because, as I said, he's the I'd say the most fascinating, and there's some great kind of imagery with his character and kind of foreshadowing, which would be good to to get into. Right, so. Let's well, let's move into it then. So, Harvey's demise, um, obviously from good to evil, that was what happened to him. Um, the Joker basically turned this white knight into uh, an evil, kind of sinister person. Um, Harvey Dent is a great character. He's not my favourite character out with the Joker in Batman. He's probably four from my list, and I'll tell you who my favorite other character is later on. But it's sad, it's kind of sad to see his demise because you know that he's trying to do everything to the best he can with with doing it lawfully. Do you know what I mean? He's everything Batman couldn't be. He's taking down the mob. Doesn't need to use you know violence to do it, and the. The, the demise of him is quite as sad, but still quite fascinating at the same time because nobody could, nobody could actually, you know, if it happened to you or me, right? How would we react in that? Because somebody has to be blamed for something here. Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? He's lost everything, um, and it's obviously a a tragic part of him kind of de- being descended into this kind of Harvey Two-Face character, which is good. They don't really reference Two-Face in the film, even though that's his name, really. They do a wee bit. Aye, but no, but no, no overlay is what I'm saying, no. Mm. No overlay. Um, it's more probably the coin that's more reference to Two-Face than him, but yeah, I'll, I'll let you go into that because you wanted to talk about the, you know, the, 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 say the symbolism and foreshadowing mm. of Harvey Dent. Sorry, so yeah. I, know, I know that I but... <laughs> What was that, sorry? Uh, I know foreshadowing's your baby. No, no, it's fine, mate. Yeah. Um, but the first thing I want to say is the actor, Aaron Eckhart, I'm surprised, this might just be me be, having not seen things, but I'm surprised I've not seen him in more things because I felt like he was one of the strongest performers in a, a, a film full of strong performers. So I'm actually surprised that he's not more widely known. Or is that just me? Or is that accurate? I've only ever seen him in one film um, before that. Well, was it, I don't know if it came before or after. I can't remember. But it was Olympus Has Fallen. Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen that, he, yeah. Where he played the president in it, I'm sure. But mm-hmm. other than that, I don't know yeah. anything else he's in. Uh, so it's a weird one because I think he gives a fantastic performance in this. Um, some of the So obviously there's the... They, they keep referencing earlier in the film that there was a, a nickname for him back in the day which was Two-Face but they don't actually reveal that 
to the end of the film there's obviously the whole idea of the 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 flip of the coin which he references at the start of the film when it was like that he says it got him his first date with rachel um and obviously that becomes his manner of deciding whether people live or die although sometimes he does a a second a second flip anyway but there's also that whole idea of the, the two sides of the coin the two faces of the coin and it's all kind of leading towards that but the first of all the the work they did with how he looks after he he has his facial injuries is amazing although the one question i have is would his eye have survived if everything else went is that accurate or is that just for the for the movie do you know what i mean I, I mean, I don't know. Aye, he said aye. <laughs> uh, I don't know, mate. They be honest with you. Um, what do you What do you think? Do you think if that whole side of the face was burnt, his his eye was still? I don't know. You think logically it would probably be, you know, it would they work? You know what I mean? Yeah. Me. But he looks, he looks, he looks scarier with the eye like that. Oh, absolutely. But the, the the bits I wanted to talk about were like when he's in the hospital bed, he's sitting kind of with his head turned so you don't actually see there's like a slow build up until you actually see what the the damage has been done there's other scenes like when he kind of takes um gordon's family where his injured half of his face is in shadow for a lot of the scene and the the final part i liked was when he died they actually they turn him off of the injured side onto the other side so that that's the the harvey that the, the kind of public will remember because that was probably his true self before his girlfriend died and he got half his face burnt off but uh, i really like the the kind of foreshadowing but also the the imagery they used with uh, harvey dent in the film no absolutely i think the effects um of you know harvey's face is is brilliant mate do you know what i mean um See, we're talking about the, the, the his face being in the shadows. Is actually it's called that's a term, mate. Um, in the movie industry, it's like, like you, you, you could be in the shadows or your face could be in the shadows. And it's called chiaroscuro. So it's quite it's quite a, um, a way where you can't see the the full impact of you know someone really. Um, but obviously, his you know his. His darker side, if I want to call it that, is no really the way they build up to that in the hospital, and then and when they meet, what's his name, uh, Gordon's family, everything was done brilliantly mm-hmm. there. Do you know what I mean? I don't think it went too long either. I think we we, we have dense scenes in it that all served a purpose. You know, he was out for revenge. Um, he gave everybody a chance. You know, do, that you, think, his... do you think Jinky flipped the coin a bit too many times? Did they overuse that a wee bit, or was it okay with you? Um, did they overuse it? Mm, they might have done, especially when probably when in the car with Maroni. Was it Maroni? Yeah, they no, shot, shot the driver, I, didn't The driver, I so he's like, "You're all right. You you fight to have another day, but yeah, your driver's not so much." I mean, to me, that doesn't make sense. If he's flipping the coins to decide people's fate, then why did he shoot the driver? It's like. Because he, he had his, it was his chance now. So Maroni, Maroni's chance was mm. he, he survived, but the, other, the driver hadn't his, had his um, opportunity yet. So that was his, you know, he didn't obviously pass. You know, he, he was shot at the back of the nut. See, because I'm contractually obliged, can I make one short Star Wars reference here? Yes. It was more in the Batman Begins, actually. I think Christian Bale would have been an excellent Anakin in the prequels. Yes, I, I, think, I think he's, he's just a mix of likability that Anakin needs, but also the, the the dark side. I think he, because I think Leo DiCaprio was meant was linked with being like Hayden Christensen's Anakin at one point. Really? But I think, um, yeah, but I think I think Christian Bale would have been an excellent Anakin. That's that's something I would have loved to have seen. As much as I like Hayden Christensen in Revenge of the Sith, but I don't think anyone likes him that <laughs> Revenge of the Sith. Um, it's Attack of the Clones he's hated. Quite a lot of people like him in Revenge of the Sith. Oh, I'll get them mixed up then. <laughs> anyway, um, I just, it was something I thought of when I watched Batman Begins. I was like, he'd have been a brilliant Anakin. 
Aye. No, it would have been. Um, Christian Bale was really good actor. I think he's maybe underrated. He's another. He's another um, actor to. He dedicates himself to roles. Mm, Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I've seen some pictures yeah. of him again, like super skinny and stuff. Like the pianist was in that one. That. Like, that film. Maybe. Wrong, that, that was my um, side. I'd be interested to see if anyone agrees with that. I see the you're talking about flipping the coin and things like that. That was obviously foreshadowed at the time where he had the the boy of the Arkham. We you know because he obviously Rachel was was the one that was next on the list due to the name tag and all that. He wanted him to find that name tag, and he took him, and he was like, um, you know, he was going to shoot him. Thomas Schiff, his name was. And um, Boyfriend Arkham, he was like, he's a, he was you know, so schizophrenic and whatever. But he flipped the coin there, and then he lived, and he was going to flip it again, and Batman stopped him. So that was like a, a foreshadowing to how he's going to end up, and how he, because the coin controlled his decision making, but then it was going to shift along to control the, you know, where he lived or died, to the, to, 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 you know, that was his decision making again at that point and mm-hmm. um, so i so it, i think probably now that i'm talking about it the, the flip of the coin probably was a bit overused like, i think did. i just think they used it too many times in quick succession i think uh, it would probably be more powerful if it had only been used like maybe once or twice i like it would have been because it was like less is more tight than mm. all right okay um I want to talk about the one more pivotal scene, and there's a, a lot of scenes I think that come before this. So, like obviously the the fairies decision making, ethical parts of it, and we can come on to that. I think is one of maybe another scene. But one thing I want to talk about is is mandatory, is the Batman sacrifice at the end of the film. So Harvey Dent obviously he's killed two cops, he's killed other folk as well. Obviously, he had Jim Gordon's son at gunpoint and things, and basically he dies. But if 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 it were to come out that Harvey Dent turned into this person, then everybody that he put in prison or whatever would then be released. And they, they said that throughout the film. They said that if whatever happened to Harvey Dent, you know, he's, he's in prison because of him. If they found out that he was responsible for all that, then what he what he stood for meant absolutely nothing. So Batman, um, you know, takes the blame for all the crimes Harvey done. He was the person that, you know, killed those people. As my speech at the start, um, kind of was was about. How did you feel about Batman taking that decision? Even though we knew, do you know what I mean, it's like it's still what happened, and Batman stands for good. Did you think it was needed? Or do you think, I think it was? Up? I think it was inevitable because he believes so strongly in what Harvey was doing. But I also think Bruce probably felt for Harvey too because he lost Rachel, which was a, a mutual loss. But then obviously what happened to him in terms of the, the physical injuries. So I felt it was a wee bit of compassion in a sense and wanting, who was ultimately overall a good guy, wanting to let him have that legacy of being a good guy for all the good things that he did um i also think it's quite integral to batman's character to basically take the blame and because he's got that he's not like your friendly neighborhood batman he's more kind of known as a vigilante so he was kind of already viewed by the public and law enforcement to be like that so I also think it does provide a good setup for kind of like I've not again I've not watched the Dark Knight Rises in a while, but Bruce is quite kind of reclusive from memory at the start of that film, so that obviously sets that up as well. So I also think it's a powerful end to the film because it, it brings in that whole quote of like he's not the hero. We, you know, the I always get that bit mixed up, but no, I, um, he, he's he's the hero that. It's not the hero go from these right now, type one. No, it's that one. No. No. I think this I think this this end scene is the is the best end to any superhero film, mate. Do you know what I mean? It's just the him it's the voiceovers for the both of them. So they're not actually talking. 
Mm -hmm. They were talking that they're not. Batman's, you know, running away, essentially. Um, and Gordon knows that he's he's innocent and all this, and he's, he is the good guy of Gotham. Mm -hmm. But in order to save Gotham's soul, it's like he's got to take the blame because everything that Harvey Dent has done has been for good. And if you find out that he, you know, that what he done after that, then it's going to go back to what it was before with all the more bosses and all that sort of stuff. So he's he's having to sacrifice himself, taking the blame for all Harvey Dent's crimes to make Gotham a better place. And that's what he wants to do. Um, I think it's eight years between Dark Knight, Rise, um, Dark Knight and Dark Knight Rises in the films. I could be wrong. What, but, um, just in, in universe, not in the, in, in, the, the in, in the universe, no new life in in the universe, in the universe. So there's a good quote that the Gordon's son says. It's like why, like why are they after him? It's it's like because we're we need to chase him or something like that. Aye, uh, yeah, you need we need, uh, we need to we need to chase him, and that's when you know he's he's not the the, the hero Gotham needs right now. Um, I've got. Just on Gordon, like obviously he essentially his death is fate. It's just it's not really that clear how they work that one out. Like, does he actually get hit or does he just go down like he's hit and they just pass it off like he died? Right. It's never really so, that clear. Yeah, so see so I'm gonna say now, right? So Jim Gordon's my probably favourite character after Bat the Joke on Batman. Right. And cause out Gary Oldman in these in this film and every one of them is phenomenal, mate. It's honestly I can't believe how much a, a performance he puts on. He's just brilliant. Um, on that scene, I'm a bit unsure of myself. I've tried to try to do a bit, a bit of digging on it. Now, I don't know is the answer, because I'm unsure that you know, Harvey Dent does think he's clearly no one on this. And I'm not even sure if Batman is on, in on it. Because, you know, I know at the end, when he, when he, when he, also when he dies, when they try to assassinate the mayor, he takes the bullet, right? When he gets when he gets hit, I don't know. He must have got hit. Do you know what I mean? But obviously a, a bulletproof vest on or something. And then, you know, Jim Gordon, he's he's dead and all that, tell his family, which is another scene by the way, is like, you know, Jesus, you know. He'll be in the he'll be in the doghouse for a while. Like <laughs> I, I, I was thinking about that scene. I was like, surely there's a way. Like they had phones, didn't they? Could he not have sent like a Or somehow, like I'm not actually dead. Instead of like letting your wife think you're dead for a while. The problem is with that is the Gordon deep down knew he couldn't trust MD and go from PD. So the only way for him to protect his family was to actually fake his own death. Do you know what I mean? To the point. Could you not just could you not just called her and withheld his number and been like, yeah, I'm not dead. <laughs> I don't know. Mate. I don't... It's not um... like it's not like Joker's hacking the phone lines and stuff, you know. Unless Batman does that. Yeah. Much to Fox's um, dismay. Yes. I just I I mean I don't know myself, mate, to be honest with you, but he you don't always really, you know, where's the where's his body taken to a morgue and all that? Do you mean where does it all go? So that scene does annoy me a wee bit because I would like to know basically, you know, what happened in between times. But I suppose as a viewer, mate, we are led to believe that Gordon's deed. Do you know what I mean? And, and I don't think I was... kind of remember. I, I could. I, I was. I was pretty certain he wasn't, even though again I hadn't seen it in a while, because I like they would him like that. He's too big a character and actor to just be like burst aside. No, exactly. No, no, the manner that he was, he, he died in. Do you know what I mean? It was he deserved a better ending than that. So I think at the time as well, I was like, nah, you can't even. Did. I'm not a big fan of fake out deaths. A lot it depends. Of depends, man. We, we've this, we've had this discussion before. I'm sure on another podcast. There's something as well that's happened. I don't know, but the, the one that, the one that came to mind, which was really poorly done, was uh, Chewbacca and Rise of Skywalker. That one was awful. That's what it was, mate. That's exactly what it was. <laughs> oh, was it when we were having the sequel discussion? Aye. Uh, yeah, that was awful because it just. You need you need stakes in movies, don't you? And this this film had plenty of stakes, so I'm not talking about this one in general. But like that movie needed stakes, and killing Chewbacca as much as we love him would have been good, but not good, but like powerful. Yeah, 
it would have been you know, initially I start Star Wars referencing. Yeah, sorry. Coming no, up. It's fine, it's you. One more and it's um, at least at least I tie them into what the th- happening in this film. They're not totally <laughs> irrelevant. That's true, mate. Right, I think it would be inappropriate, mate. I'm gonna move in now and I'm gonna speak about characters. We think we've we've discussed you no know, Harvey Dent, we've discussed um Rachel, and we've just Batman as well to a degree, I think. But I think it's only important, mate, that we discuss the Joker in more detail. Right? I know we've kind of had a half discussion around them, but the, for the Joker, he stole the show for me, without a shadow of a doubt. The same way, and I said this in one of the Twitter comments or Facebook comments, it was like uh, a mirror image of Batman 89, where, you know, on the actual credits, on the, on the DVD cover, or the film poster, whatever it was, it had Nicholson's name first and then Keaton because you know what Nicholson's character in this is the the main attraction. And I still feel that in this film, Heath Ledger, his character for the Joker was out outdone Christian Bale's Batman. And Christian Bale's Batman might be the, the you know the the head haunt show. You know what I'm saying? I don't think that's I don't think that's a criticism of Bale, essentially. I think no, it's no, more, no, no, absolutely uh, not, mate. Absolutely not. And I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that he Fledger was that dedicated to the part that he brought another level to it that probably nobody thought they could have done. You know what I mean? Now, see the Joker, right? Every scene he's in is, you know, memorable. But do I like about the Joker? And I read this as well, that you know when he's talking, he licks his lips a lot. Mm-hmm. So... That added another layer to how the Joker is, but the the real reason why he licked his lips and, or lick, you know his mouth and whatever during the scenes of the Joker is it because he did prosthetics on his face, they kept them falling off. So he, he, the way to actually try and keep them in place, or whatever, was to you know use his tongue to, and it actually worked, worked out to be better because I found it quite menacing the way he was talking. He was yeah. just kind of licking his lips and you what know, was this guy all about? He's he's crazy. Do you know what I mean? Um, I'm going to say one more thing about the Joker, and you know what you're going to let you carry on, right? But the Joker always spoke about being chaotic, he always spoke about unpredictability and the, the willingness to not have a plan. However, surely the Joker had plans, <laughs> he had plans to block the hospital. How did the C4 get into the hospital? Right. There's also the 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 scene where, you know, and I'm going to want it later on, is the Rachel and Harvey Dent getting taken to separate places to get blown up. That doesn't happen by chance. So he does have plans, but again, it's the way he portrays himself is like, oh, the plans. I'm kind of, you know, ahead of the curve type of thing. I'm just, create, you know, I create a kind of an order by being chaotic type of thing. I just found that a bit odd because they have plans you're organised, right? You think mm-hmm. Batman, you know, he's 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 from an order, but the way that Joker portrays himself is chaotic. But really, in the background, there was plans in place. I don't know what you thought about that, mate. Yeah, I remember that because he, he was talking about how if um, a thousand people die in a bombing, people are okay with it because it's. Um, it was planned, whereas if one mayor, who before we forget, is the guy that lost. Um, if, if one person, like the mayor, gets gunned down, then everyone's going mental because it seems random. But I think what you were saying and what he says works in a roundabout way. Like He's saying he doesn't have plans, but he is he is chaotic. So when he's saying Basically, he makes stuff up and changes his story all the time. Remember, we were talking about earlier with the how he got the, how, how he got the scars. Aye. So the fact the fact he's saying he doesn't make plans, he could turn around half an hour later and be bigging up his plans. So, in a roundabout way, I think it actually makes sense because you can't, you can't really believe uh, what he's saying. That's true, and the plans of the bank case as well. Do you know what I mean? That's just mental. Um, yeah. He's also just downplaying it because, like, as as bad as all the things he does are, 
he's still quite likable because he's quite funny and actually quite polite sometimes as well. So he, he has all these kind of different parts to his his character. Aye, uh, and his laugh as well. I mean, it's very eerie. Um, mm -hmm. You do feel on, you do feel kind of on the edge every time he's on the screen um, about kind of what's going to happen next. Aye. Uh, even the bit where as well, like see when he's got the the fake Batman on camera and he's mm. talking to the news, Gotham PD, or sorry, Gotham News, whatever it is, and he's talking to him. And then even he goes from that kind of kind of joke joker kind of talk way he talks and laughing, and then it's like the serious look at me. That was a different as well. That was like mm. proper. Do you know what I mean? That was quite sinister. And then there's a bit as well after the hospital where he takes the bus and he's he's got the, the hostages and he's telling he's kind of reading them out reading them out and he's in the background saying the last word of every sentence it still might be funny but the mm. way he does it is funny do you know what i mean yeah and he he definitely suited the nurse the nurse outfit as well <laughs> uh, i had a lot of things um before before i did work uh, doing this but so how come Harvey Dent didn't know that was a joker? <laughs> I did not realise that was a joker uh, in Nazi uniform, do you know what I mean? But, but so there's, a, there's the famous bit where he's obviously walking away from the hospital and like three quarters of the explosion happened, but then it just stops and he just gets the the kind of remote out and just starts playing away. Was that the bit that was improv? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then he just jumps onto a bus. Uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd love to see that scene in the bus where he's just with these people, like what they're making of him. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I know. There's, oh, a, there's another funny bit that reminded me of the bit with the remote where there's two kids that are like pretending to shoot and their car blows up. Do you know what I mean? There's two kids just on the street and they're pretending to shoot a pretend gun. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then the car just blows up and they think they did it. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to I went over scenes mate like, it's kind of mandatory but is there any scene that you want to kind of bring up that you thought if I had you brought it up then you want to talk about give you the, the floor a wee bit uh, I would say we've, by, by the nature of what you're doing I'd say you probably kind of covered the main ones well, so we kind of glossed over the bit on the the boats where if like they could go and press the button and it would kill the people on the other boat and they were just about to do it and then the guy who has the remote's like well they haven't done it yet either and that was quite tense because there was argument so you've obviously got a boat full of criminals who you wouldn't think would hesitate to kill like civilians but they did And then you've got a group of like by all accounts innocent civilians that would be justified in wanting to take out people who committed loads of crimes. But that was an interesting part. It was also interesting for me that Joker let that slide. I kind of thought no matter what happened there, he would just blow them both up or blow one of them up. But the fact that they both did, did they both survive or did I misread that? No, they both survived. Yeah, they, they did. So that was interesting that he let that play out like that. I thought it was just like a fake bit of hope for them uh, but it, it, it actually turned out to be legit well the joker did try and blow them up but he, he failed at the end didn't he mm. yeah like if you want to do something right you've got to do it yourself type thing but no I, but yeah. that was i'm glad you brought that scene up mate because it was one obviously one of mine but um i you think there's all on the boat there was like one person who was like a complete kind of arsehole do you know what i mean you had like the Oh, if nobody's going to be bad enough to do it, then you know what I'll do it. And then when it gets to the pressing the, the trigger, they can't do it. Do you know what I mean? And it's the same. You know, on the other boat, um, the guy who's like, give me the trigger, can't do it, blah, blah. And he ends up throws it out the window because, you know, he's a set for his fate. Do you know what I mean? Because he's probably thought they were, they've, he knows that they're going to, going to kill them because they're all criminals. Do you know what I mean? For whatever crimes they've what committed. What, what would you have done? I was going to, you beat me to it. I was going to ask you the same question. Um, right. Paul, edit it out. <laughs> um, what would I have done? I would, I don't know, mate. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think it, it all depends on who's on the boat at the time, right? I know it's, I think it'll be an easy, can I get out for me? But 
you're we talk about you know in Deadpool Society last week about conformity and all that sort of thing and with peer pressure and all that right and I think when you get into a situation like that you're depending on who's you've got everybody's got their own moral compass right but it might be out of your control somebody could easily overpower you on that boat you know, I'm the strongest guy, you know what I mean? Like some, obviously, there's always going to be somebody bigger bigger than you. If I had the decision for me personally, I probably wouldn't. But that, that would be taken out of my hands, I reckon. Because people are very, um, in the joke of thought, people are very reactive and they're very impulsive. And um, the joker failed in that regard. But I wouldn't I wouldn't be going to give me that trigger. I'm going to blow them up. I, I, I could have done it. I mean, I couldn't live with that, mate. Do you know what I mean? What about you? Yeah, I, I, I don't think I'd be the one to, to press the button, but see if you're on the boat surrounded by like, your closest friends and family and the other boat is people who are known to be murderers themselves. Like You can at least understand the, the dilemma that they were facing. That's what I mean. It depends on who's on the boat as well. Do you know what I mean? It, it's just... Uh, it's a, I mean, that's, that's the whole... The ethical nature that's why he's done it do you know what i mean mm-hmm. um and the joker failed Mo- movies are so deep aren't they yes that's why like see people you, you probably came across this as well see and it's people's own options like some people prefer to do different things with their time but see when you see people that just say they don't watch movies i'm kind of like you're missing it and so much so much stuff like stuff that might on the surface just seem like a superhero movie, but there's so many like life lessons and philosophies you can take away from from movies. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I mean, I don't get it myself. Listen, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of crap music uh, movies out there. Do you know what I mean? But um, if you go into a podcast like the way we are doing, and we kind of take deep dives on different themes and all that sort of thing, do you know what I mean? You, you do learn a lot. You learn a lot about maybe. A, hidden meaning, meanings and different things like that. Do you think it's funny that where I've been sitting in most of this podcast, it looks like I've got bat wings coming at my head. You have, mate. You've, aye. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to bring up one last scene, mate, if it's okay. It's and it's okay. the scene where um, the interrogation part, when Gordon's interrogating the Joker, and it's like, oh, it's the, the bad cop, good cop routine type thing. And he goes, not exactly. And then the joke, the Batman's behind him, slams the Joker's uh, head on the on the desk, and then you know, kind of just kind of beats him up. And that's when he reveals that you know, you know, he's took Harvey Dent and he's took Rachel away, and the Batman's got to make a decision on who he's to who is to he's to save basically, because he's going to break his one rule. He's one rule, obviously, can he be to kill people? And even though if he, he wants to kill the Joker, but if he kills the Joker, that means he, he, the Joker's won because he's broke his moral compass. But then he's like, well, you're going to have to break one rule. You've had to let one die. And then that's the famous scene of, no, where are they? And he goes, Rachel. And so he, the Joker tells him the, the two addresses and he gives... The Batman, he gives Batman the wrong address for Rachel on purpose, so he goes and saves saves Harvey Dent because obviously by saving Harvey Dent, Rachel's deed, and that's him moving on to you know the, the Harvey Dent's arc to becoming the, the villain. Do you know what I mean? Hmm. So it was all planned in that way. Again, another plan. So I like that scene. Me, I thought it was one of the best scenes. It was you know. It was loud. It's either the music behind it as well. Do you know what I mean the, the the score behind it? It was like, oof, this is it's very tense. And even the jokers, trying tense, to make, yeah. the, the jokers trying to make jokes through it as well. Do you know what I mean saying he, he's not a monster? He's the head of the curve. Meaning, you know, he's in his in his head that he is he is plan. He is you know normal. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean he's no. Yeah, you've obviously seen this film a lot more times than me, so I didn't actually clock that. I didn't actually clock that he'd given him the wrong address. I thought that him and Gordon had just decided that they were going to go to those locations. Because obviously, although Batman didn't go to Rachel, at least Gordon was going to Rachel, so she would theoretically get saved. So that's a takeaway there. 
Oh, he, he, he does say she goes to this address, or like mm -hmm. she goes to that address, and he's at that address. But he knew that he would go to Rachel, but he did. But he knew he would go to go and get Rachel, but he actually, um, what was it? He was going to what's his name? Harvey Dent. This is going to sound like a really obvious question, and I might as well ask it so I know for certain. I just kind of assume, see, like Batman's whole thing about not using a gun is just because his parents buy a gun. We just, mate, you broke up there, I can't hear you. Sorry. Um, I basically just said the, the reason Batman refuses to use a gun is just because his parents got killed by a gun. That's. That was never explicitly said, I don't but I must have been that's why. Um, well, he does use guns, just not or like it's in, his, in his vehicle, don't I mean his Batmobile and whatever have you, but mm -hmm. um, but I think that's it's what I took care of it anyway. I, I don't know if it's if it's as deep as that, but I, it makes sense. Aye, I, I think it's what to do with you know, because guns the, and their chance of killing people when he doesn't want to kill people, do you know what I mean? It's no, that's no reason why he doesn't. But maybe the reason why he doesn't want to kill people is because of what happened to his parents. Aye. Um, because um, obviously the imposter Batman is shooting guns and that's how they, they realise it's not him quite quickly. Aye. At the, at the start. That's it, aye. That's not Batman. <laughs> okay, well, well, this is maybe one of the longest ones we've done, mate, so I'm conscious of time. Um, is there anything you want to add before we give our, our scores no uh, nothing coming to mind right okay um so then obviously before i, I do finish up i do want to say the score of the film in cinematography was outstanding um it's the scenes in hong kong in particular when he goes to to get a uh, lao back then the skyline in the the buildings were amazing just to you know, from the the bit in the building where he goes back onto the plane, but it was a phenomenal, mate. Do you know what I mean? Um, and the score for every character as well. You knew Batman was on the screen. You knew the Joker was on the screen just because of the you know, the the score behind them. I don't know what you thought. If it, you know, did it for you? Did it create a kind of attention in that? Yeah, I think it was a really tense film. I, must admit, I didn't pay that much close attention to the score but sometimes that's because you're too focused on kind of what's happening in front of you if that makes sense so the next time I watch this film then it's definitely something I'll, I'll pay more heed to uh, it's probably because I've seen this film loads of little yeah. times I think uh, you focus more on the music with films as you say if you've if you've seen them like uh, a lot of times because you know, you know exactly what's happening in the movie. Indeed. Okay, what we'll do then, mate, we'll call it a, a day. And before we do that, we'll only give a seismic scores, man. So out of 10, what do you rate The Dark Knight? Right. So I would, I'm going to give it an 8.5. Okay. So... The reason behind that is, well, I said at the start, I was, I've was i never been like a kind of traditional Batman fan, although I'm, I would say I'm getting there in recent years, but I think as a movie, it's definitely action-packed, full of action, great visual effects, etc. Where I took a point and a half off it, it might seem a wee bit petty, but I feel like the the Rachel casting was very jarring for me, and I didn't really like her as a character. I also feel like I don't think there was I don't think this one quite got to that level, but I think sometimes movies like this there can be a wee bit maybe too much going on, like maybe too many characters and too many plot lines. I think this one was fine, but I think there was maybe a, at times too many players in the game. I don't know your thoughts on that. The last thing was, and this is more of a this is more of a comparison to Batman Begins, and that I, I preferred Gotham as a city in Batman Begins because it was like the Gotham you got in the Dark Knight more just looked like 
traditional New York, whereas Gotham and Batman Begins was a lot darker, a lot kind of alive. It felt it felt more like a a character in itself in that one. But obviously, we've we've talked about all the things we loved about it: Joker's performance, uh, Harvey Dent's character arc. Um, all the kind of ten scenes, etc. So I really did in, enjoy watching it. Um, but that was just a couple of things that took it away from ten for me personally. But again, I'm not a crazed Batman fan like yourself, so I'd say eight point five is quite strong coming from myself. That's fair enough, man. Um, you know, everyone's entitled to the the seismic stars. You know, <laughs> um, I. No surprise to you, mate. I'm going to give us a 10 out of 10. Um, now, I completely get you in terms of Rachel. Do you know what I mean? She's not the character that I would like to have seen from the previous film. Um, but it's not enough for me to give to take points off it. So, I, I can see why you have. Um, I also understand your, your reasoning behind Gotham. I think, I think it's maybe because I watched Batman Begins the night before as well. Aye, uh, it would be a factor in it, to be honest with you, but um, it, it doesn't really bother me. You know, Gotham is a you know a dark, a dark city anyway. Do you know what I mean? It's where we we kind of they see it, kind of more kind of I don't know in a, a kind of nicer state, if you will. Do you know what I mean? I think because maybe it was Batman Begins was the introduction, you know, of of, you know, of that trilogy. Mm-hmm. It kind of gave you a sense of what Gotham was like, and yeah. it had to be that way. Um, but for, for me, it's a ten out of ten, man. I just like other than you know Rachel, but it's not enough for me to 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 give it a nine. I think um, Bale is was excellent in it. Um, I think the Joker was excellent in it. Uh, though Keith Ledger was fantastic in it. Um, Jim Gordon, I think. You know, even Morgan Freeman as well. Do you know what I mean? He was brilliant. I just, um, I can't, I can't say really you know, hand to heart. See, like hand to heart. Um, a bad thing about it. I think really. we need to be. I think we need to be honest though. We're, we're talking about an eight point five and a nine. Like I've given it a four. Like eight point five and nine is is a really high score. Do you know what I mean? I don't give it a nine. I give it a ten. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just talking about the fact. I've given it eight point oh, five, yeah. but because it's one of your like, favorite films of all time, your view in eight point five is low, whereas eight point five is a pretty high score, I would say. No, I know as no, as a high score. I mean, I just cause I, I hold the film in higher regard, mm. like very high regard. Do you know what I mean, it's, it's um, I think I think I mean, it's just Batman in itself, is not one of my favorite franchises. I've, I've always been more Spider Man or X Men or Star Wars, Harry Potter. So like, I really enjoyed it, and I am becoming more of a fan as the years go on. Well, good mate. I listen. I said at the start of this podcast, um, that or this episode anyway, that you know this beats any any superhero film in entirety, right? It's better than any MCU film, and I, I don't care what you say. Um, the trilogy as a whole, maybe not, but the trilogy is still still strong. This being the best begins being the second best, and. Dark Knight Rises has been obviously the last in it, but I think for the start to finish, this film is is perfect, man. You know, even the ending is just like what a, what an ending to a superhero film, man. Do you know what I mean? Just it's just um it's just amazing, you know. So if you have if you have disagreed with me, anybody who's listening and watching, then please tell me what your favourite superhero film is. It's better than this because I really can't see any. Colin probably has Spider Man up there, but or some one of the Avengers. But to be fair, I can't think of an individual Spider Man film that's stronger than this off the top of my head. But uh, I just I just prefer Spider Man more as a character based on my life experience, you know. Aye. Uh, well, okay. So you get an eight point five, I give it a ten. So that's a, a decent healthy score. Um Okay then. So well, um, we'll finish up there then. Unless there's anything you want to say, Colin, before I... Uh, I just want to reveal, I've, I've decided what my pick for next week's going to be. All right, because I don't know what it was. 
I I toyed with the idea of continuing the Christian Bale by doing American Psycho, but I think that was maybe one of your original mentions, so I might leave that one to you to host. Okay. So I think it's time to do it, and I think it'll be good fun, and it's an easy rewatch for me, and it continues the Gary Oldman theme. I think uh-huh. we will do. I think we will do Prisoner of Azkaban next week. Okay, fair enough. We'll do that. Which is a widely regarded as the best directed of the Harry Potter films. So that could be good fun. I look forward to talking about the the time turning scene. <laughs> yeah, <Very fun travel. laughs> that'll be good. That'll be good fun. Okay, right. So next week we're doing Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Okay, that sounds good. Um, right, okay, so before we finish up then, I'll just kind of go over the housekeeping again, so uh, you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Threads, TikTok, and Facebook, you can also watch and listen to us on YouTube and Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Audible, and Amazon Music. There we go. So, thank you very much. Um, if you, again, guys, if you want to like, subscribe, share, on any of our um, places you can get our music from, it'd be good. We do get the channel does grow if you like and comment and subscribe. So we very much want the seismic cinema to to take off. So it would be much appreciated if you could do that. Okay, folks. Right. Okay. So we'll call it a day there then. So we are seismic cinema. I'm James. I probably wrote an essay on it. Paul has probably watched it in the wrong order. And I've probably not seen it. Thank you, guys. Housewarming Saturday, sorry I can't. Wedding reception, no sorry.